what is LP little a and what does it tell us different from other measures within the lipid profile? Well, it's a very important lipid particle. It's elevated well above the upper limits of normal in about 20% of the global population. The reason it's so important, it is very strongly associated with atherosclerotic vascular disease and aortic stenosis. And it has historically been an untreatable disorder. We generally consider levels above about 50 to 70 milligrams per deciliter or 125 to 150 nanomoles per liter as being strongly associated with disease. We see people with very extreme levels and those people tend to have this disorder within their families. And it is important to understand that it is unlike LDL or any other lipid particle because it's almost exclusively determined by genetics. And both alleles, that is the allele from each parent, contributes. And so uh, we see that there's a high concordance rate for the disorder amongst first-degree relatives. How does this inform who should be tested for LP little a levels? Well, that's an extraordinarily important question. Most of us working in the field and some organizations like the National Lipid Association recommend that every adult have it tested at least once, preferably early in life, like in their 20s. Once you've obtained a level, there is no reason to repeat it because then change. Remember that it's not affected by lifestyle or anything else. You know, if you're at 180 animals per liter when you're 25, that's what you're going to be when you're 45 or 65. So we think everybody should be tested early in life, but we also recommend cascade screening. And so the, one of the most important questions I ask patients when I see them with a high lipoprotein A is, do you have any children? Do you have any siblings? Are your parents still alive? How do you go about counseling patients as to what LP little a is, the nature of this test, and how it relates to their uh, atherosclerotic vascular disease risk? So let me tell you the most important message that I give to these patients is I say, we can't lower your lipoprotein A, but we can take all your other risk factors off the table. We get your LDL down. Typically, I try to get down below 55 milligrams per deciliter. We get your blood pressure under good control. We make sure you're not overweight. We make sure you exercise and we try to either prevent or treat diabetes. So all of the conventional risk factors. And what we find is if you really treat the other risk factors well, you can often keep people safe, uh, at least in the short term. And those that have had an event, we can help prevent a recurrent event. So specifically within the context of primary prevention, for whom does this test tip the scales for initiation of a statin therapy? It's an important question. Okay. The current guidelines consider lipoprotein A a REF, a risk-enhancing factor. And in my view, that's not strong enough. I tend to put almost all of them on a statin unless their LDL is... 40 or something like that, which is obviously very rare because uh, we know statins reduce risk. I see these patients every Friday. I have a clinic. It's mostly lipoprotein A patients. They come from all over the world. They find me and they'll come in and they'll say, everybody in my family's had a heart attack, a stroke, bypass surgery, or a stent in their late thirties, early forties, early fifties. And their levels modestly elevate. What should I do? My judgment is that I offer patients the opportunity to be more intensively treated when they have that kind of malignant family history. With that said, so I know certainly statin therapy, aggressive lifestyle modification, all pillars of primary prevention. Is there any role of 
aspirin for primary prevention in right. this patient right. population specifically given the pathogenesis of ASCVD with LP little We don't have very good data. We have some data from some of the aspirin trials that does suggest a benefit of aspirin in primary prevention in people with a high lipoprotein A. It's not very good data. It wasn't primarily what they were investigating. Um, that being said, because lipoprotein A is both pro-atherogenic and pro-thrombotic, I treat many of these people with low-dose aspirin, and I treat almost nobody else in primary prevention with low-dose aspirin, but these people I make an exception. No, that certainly seems to make sense, just understanding the pathophysiology of their disease. With that said, even further, I know one of the only therapies that is out there that has been shown to lower LP little a are the PCSK9 inhibitors. A aside from those patients who are not meeting their LDL goal just with statin and azetamibe alone, are there any patients with extremely high LP little a levels that would warrant or that would be considered for PCSK9 therapy independent of their LDL? I know there are people that do it. I do. And uh, I'm going to tell you why. If you look at some of the data, let's say from the 4EE trial, the people that got the biggest reduction in lipoprotein A were people that had low to mid-range lipoprotein A levels. Those in the top quartile got a 16 milligram per deciliter reduction in lipoprotein A. Not very much. And you've got a therapy that's expensive, requires self-injection every couple of weeks, has no substantial data suggesting a benefit. So I don't do it. And if you look at the estimates of how much you have to lower lipoprotein A to get a benefit, we're talking about in the range of 100 milligram per deciliter reduction. And so... 16 to 30 milligrams per deciliter. You know, the amount you get with PCSK9 inhibition, your risk hasn't changed very much. If you look at it, you're still in the extremely high risk category. And so I just don't see it as being a rational way to go. Moving to this secondary prevention bucket of patients, um, just in a general sense, are there any differences in management that you would recommend for patients who have had a previous event that also happen to have LP little a levels that are elevated as compared to your demographic of patients that do not have elevated LP little a? Yeah. You know, I see them relatively similarly, except that let's just say I'm more insistent to the patient that they, that their risk factors need to be modified. In a similar sense, in patients who have had an MI, had a stent placed, you know, you have two patients with an identical stent after an event, does elevated LP little a inform your decision making on who to prolong courses of dual antiplatelet therapy versus, you know, more of a traditional 12 months? I don't modify. I don't give dual antiplatelet therapy differently for those patients. Yes, we have to sometimes guess at what's right, but I like to have at least some theta before I'm going to make a recommendation. Wonderful. Thank you again so much for going through all of these points. One thing I'd like to ask you is, is there any pain points that you find when talking with colleagues or internists that you would like to dispel or address at this all point? Right. I'm going to tell you candidly, why this, why internists are a major part of the problem. I have patients coming to me that have a terrible family history and they learn about lipoprotein A. There's a, there's an organization called the Family Heart Foundation that's focused on both LDL, that is familial hyperlipidemia and lipoprotein A. And so these patients find out about lipoprotein A and they go to see their internist and they say, I'd like you to check my lipoprotein A. And their internist says, no, I won't check. It. There's nothing we can do about it. And we're not going to, we're not going to test. 
and I hear this over and over again in patients who come to see me. And at some point, many of them will go out and they'll go to a Quest lab or someplace like that where you can actually get a test on your own and they'll find out that their lipoprotein A is really high and they come to see me. So internists who are hearing this need to understand that nihilism is not an effective management strategy. If I'm taking nothing else away from this episode, it's, it's certainly that there should be an impetus to be testing LP little a in all comers as it really helps flesh out their full cardiovascular disease risk profile. Well, all you need to do is have it tested once. And so it's not like something you're going to test over and over and over again. So if you look at the societal cost for testing, you know, it's pretty low. It's not an expensive test. It's readily available and everybody can get it. So there are organizations now saying everybody in their early 20s ought to have our, their lipoprotein A tested. So, I'm, you know, do it once. And when I say knowledge is power, I mean knowledge is power. We saw the same thing, you know, in the early days of statins. I'm old enough to remember this when people weren't getting tested and people weren't getting treated. And we had to do a massive uh, education of both physicians and the public in order to overcome these barriers. We're in the same position again. 